This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. The best day of the entire year in motorsports is just around the corner with Memorial Day weekend approaching. We have got the Indy 500, the Coca-Cola 600, and the Monaco Grand Prix coming up on Sunday. So who better to break it all down than Dr. Nick Giffen of the Action Network. He is here today to break down his thoughts on Indy, talk some Coke 600, and I'll talk about where I see value for the Monaco Grand Prix as well. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a Managing Editor of Digital Media for FanDuel Research, joined here as mentioned by Dr. Nick Giffen. Check him out on Twitter at Rotodoc. Find his work at the Action Network, where he is a predictive analyst. Or analyst. You can also find him on the Stacking Denny's podcast and the Running Hot podcast as well. Nick, happy motorsports Christmas to you. How you doing? Oh, man, I'm fantastic. It's, you know, it's like you said, it's Christmas for the motorsports fans. And, uh, it you know, hopefully we get all three races in on Sunday. I'll just say that because it's certainly Indy. Is looking a little iffy. My weather underground tab is getting abused uh, as a result of this, uh, partly because of baseball stuff, but also like I'm checking Indy every now and then. And like if it ruins the narrative or like the, the fun of watching Kyle Larson do the double, I'm going to be pretty sad. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly the biggest headline from this whole motorsports weekend is Kyle Larson doing the double. I would love to see it happen all on the same day. But, you know, if it gets pushed to Monday, then it almost becomes stress free double as long as. Rick Hendrick still allows him to do the 600 uh, or sorry, the Indy 500 on Monday, yeah. given his NASCAR obligations. But I think he would. I think it'd be fine. So, you know, it makes it easier for him to do both races. But at the same time, it's not quite the same hype of both on the same day. Right. And I have a flight on Sunday and I'm like, I want to like, I'm going to tape delay this, the Coke 600. And I'm like, if I can't get to watch Indy before the flight too, and I'm just going from Monaco and like sitting around until my flight, I'll be pretty sad. So yeah. selfishly want that in both for Larson and for my own personal interests as well. We're going to talk about Kyle Larson's prospects or potentially winning the Indy 500. We'll talk about where Nick has seen value at FanDuel Sportsbook for the 500 and then talk some Coke 600 and Monaco Grand Prix as well. But first a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to covering the spread wherever you get your podcast tomorrow. Tomorrow, Tom Vecchio back with us breaking down NBA NHL conference final games where he sees value there. Get that by subscribing to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. Search for Covering the Spread. Hit subscribe. If you like what you hear, give us a five-star rating and review as well. The NBA conference finals are here, and you can get in on the action with FanDuel because right now, new customers get $150 bucks in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 to use on same-game parlays, live bets, championship futures, and so much more. There is no better place to bet all the playoff action than America's number one sportsbook, FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Must be 21+, plus and present in select states. First online real money wager. Only $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets, which expire seven days after receipt. Not available in North Carolina. Restrictions apply. Buy see terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, D.C., Illinois, Iowa, Kentucky, Michigan, New Jersey, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Vermont, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777. Or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut. 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana. 1-800-522-4700. Visit ksgamblinghealth.com in Kansas. 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland. 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia. 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York. Now, Nick, we'll begin to Indy here in just one second, but we talked to you about your NASCAR process before. Let's talk Indy this time around because a ton of data to dissect from practice sessions throughout the entire month of May, qualifying, etc., but what all do you consider before you place a bet for the Indy 500? Yeah, this is, you know, I'm predictive analyst, but this is more art than science when we're betting the Indy 500. The, the data 
can be misleading. It's almost a fool's errand to, to immerse yourself in Indy 500 practice data. And that's because of the draft, the toe, uh, as we say in, in open wheel parlance. Uh, that can lead to some artificially inflated times if you just get a monster toe down the kilometer long straightaway. Uh, you know, and especially on both kilometer long straightaways, that'll put a monstrous lap time on the board that isn't real. Now, of course, you will be in the toe in the race. So what instead we look for is who is able to make those passes, get that toe set up just right to where they can make passes at the end of those straightaways easier than other cars. So that's what I'm looking for. So I'm watching practice. I'm listening to what the drivers say. I'm listening to what their engineers or strategists say. Uh, so this is definitely more art than science when betting the Indy 500, but we do have data points to back it up. And I think for me, I talk about four major data points. One, the equipment, just like in NASCAR, equipment is important. Your bigger teams will do better. Uh, but that doesn't mean the smaller teams can't win. You just need those other things to go right for them as well. Number two would uh, certainly be the difference between qual trim and, and race trim, like I was talking about, right? The Penske's looked amazing in qualifying. They swept the front row. Are they going to be as good in the race? No, the field will even up a little bit. So we got to, that's the, you know, the art part that I was talking about, evaluating practice based off how drivers look, what they're saying. Uh, and then even things like, when are they making adjustments? Alex Pillow, after a week of practice last week and then Monday this week, 14 minutes left in the practice session, comes into the garage for wholesale changes. That tells you he's not happy with his car, right? Those are the kind of things we look for. So that's number two. Number three, what's your Indy 500 history? We see drivers like Santino Ferrucci just always do great at Indy. Uh, Renus VK, very good at Indy, even though he hasn't sometimes always had the finishes uh, to show for it. There's certain drivers that just do great here. And then also just ovals in general. Uh, we also, you know, IndyCar has also run at Texas in the past, not this year, but, but last year, year before Gateway, which is Worldwide Technology Raceway. So just kind of your overall oval performances. Well, that's super duper low on the list, but mostly it's the art of understanding these cars in race conditions. Now, you've been doing this for a long time, so you kind of know what to listen for when you're listening to drivers and engineers talk. Who do you has had like the best, I don't know, confidence, the best, the best vibes for you? Vibes based betting. Who has it had the best, like yeah. best outward expression towards how they feel about their car this week? Yeah, I think you have to go to the driver whose shirt I'm wearing, and that's Colton Herta. Uh <laughs> he is the the commentators, the broadcasters, uh drivers, not just Colton Herta himself, but other drivers have said, you know, Herta looks great, Herta can draft really well, he can he can suck up, so to speak, really well, which is you know, pull up to the car in front of you to make passes. And Herta himself on Monday, which was the the race practice uh comparison, you know, because we had qualifying on Saturday and Sunday. So then they go back to race practice on Monday. Colton Herta said last year was the best car he ever had at the Indy 500. His ninth place finish was probably a little unflattering for how good that car was. He said this car this year, just as good, maybe even better. So um, Colton Herta, I think, uh, you know, 13 to one at FanDuel. I think uh, as long as 15 to one out there, I like it. I bet him to win. Uh, I bet him 20 to one last week when, you know, all these things were being said, but it was before practice and qualifying and before all this attention came onto the Indy 500. But I'd still bet him, honestly, I'd still bet him at 13. If you can find him maybe as a top Honda, I think I like that. But, uh, you know, I think he's down to around four to one as top Honda. So why not just take 13 to win if he's going to be a top Honda? Here's the thing. The difference between Honda and Chevy was very pronounced in qualifying. Chevy took nine of the top 12 spots in qualifying. But Honda is going to make better fuel mileage. And that is huge in the Indy 500. We don't have stages in the Indy 500 like we do in NASCAR. So it is all about managing your fuel mileage. Sometimes these races end with the driver running out of fuel and crossing, <laughs> you know, the, the brickyard, the brick yard of bricks uh, like Rossi did in 2016. But even if that doesn't come into play, it is so important to save fuel because you can shorten your pit stop times and or run harder at the end if you have a little more fuel to burn than the guys uh, in front of you. So I, I think Honda's undervalued in the market. And that's why I like Colton Herta. Great in race trim. Everybody's talking about how good he is in race trim, how he can pass almost at will, uh, plus that little extra fuel potential savings with the Honda engine there. Okay, so Herta 13 to 1, a potential consideration for Nick here based on what he's heard from Herta and what he's seen from the Hondas overall at Indy. Let's talk Larson trying to run the double. Uh, he is plus 650 to win at FanDuel Sportsbook. And 
that's insane. It, it makes sense given that he he qualified as well as he did, but also he hasn't had restarts yet. I know. I think it was there was someone who was. I think it was Kurt Busch when he ran the double talked about how tough restarts restarts were. So mm-hmm. haven't seen that from Larson yet. Uh, there's the draft which he doesn't handle well in NASCAR. Uh, so what's your view of Larson here? Can he actually pull this off at plus six fifty? Can he? Yes. Is it likely? No. Um, I'm much lower than I think public sentiment is on Larson. Uh, and it's not because I don't think he's good or anything like that. I think he's going to be great. I think he'll learn quickly. I think he'll adapt very well. There's just so much to adapt to. You mentioned the draft, how to set up cars, but also the way the fall off happens at Indy tire fall off managing long runs. All these things are so important. Getting in and out of pit road. We see incidents on pit road all the time at the Indy 500, especially from rookie drivers or, or one-off drivers. Uh, Catherine Legg had an incident last year. Renus VK himself, who is a full-time driver, had an incident and collected Alex Pillow. Uh, We saw an incident uh, on Monday. I forget which rookie driver it was, but it was Tom Blumquist uh, had an incident on pit road, all just getting on or off pit road or, or into and out of their pit box even, just gunning it too hard leaving their pit box and spinning out. So then there's all the, the Indy car versus a NASCAR is so different because in NASCAR and Larson mentioned this in his interview, you don't make adjustments as a driver, right? You just hit the gas or the right. brakes and you, <laughs> you shift. But in Indy car, you're playing with a weight jacket. You're playing with the anti-roll bar. You're setting fuel mixtures. You're doing all sorts of things that are going to be a challenge throughout the race for Kyle Larson. Plus now you're actually running in traffic. That's trying to pass you instead of, being okay with them passing you in a practice right. mode, right? So I think there's a lot to overcome. I think he'll be better than Kurt Busch. And Kurt Busch finished sixth, but Kurt Busch almost didn't pass anybody. It was more like yeah. this driver crashed out of the way. That driver crashed out of the way. Uh, and he just kind of rode his way forward to six. I think Carson, Kyle Larson will be more racy than Kurt Busch, but ultimately I don't think he'll win the race. Uh, and then there's always the chance of he may have to leave right. because of the rain and the forecast as well. And for that reason, make sure you know house rules for your sports book. If you want to bet Larson, like if you think that he can win this race, make sure you know house rules um, because it's sometimes it's whether they attempt to qualify, they automatically count as action, uh, which he already would count as action as a result of that if they are on the formation lap, stuff like that. So make sure you know house rules always, but especially for Larson with this weekend. Now you talked about Team Penske a bit already, and it sounds like you think they're a bit overvalued here based on how fast they were in qualifying. That's kind of driven their prices down. Are you pretty actively avoiding the, the Penske drivers now based on where their odds currently sit? For the race, yes. But I do think I have a very interesting way to play the team Penske cars. And that's not to win the race, but to win the championship. Oh, okay. So... Uh, unfortunately, FanDuel has McLaughlin priced very correctly for the championship, but there are <laughs> books out there that don't. And I would take Scott McLaughlin to win the championship at 12 to one. I think this is the perfect spot to take him as the pole sitter, as the race favorite uh, for the Indy 500. And if he wins the race, that's great because, uh, you know, that's a great leap forward in the championship standings where he currently six, sits sixth. And that's with a disqualification already uh, from that disqualification at St. Pete. And the other part is in the championship, we have a ton of ovals. The, the calendar is backloaded with ovals. And Alex Pillow, who's sitting there as the, the championship favorite at plus 170, is not as good on ovals as Joseph Newgarden. Scott McLaughlin, Will Power. Uh, Newgarden, I think, is just too far back in the point standings to, to consider here for a championship. But Will Power at eight or nine, uh, which is floating around out there. And Scott McLaughlin, if you can get him in double digits, I, I really like betting Team Penske, those two drivers specifically, to win the championship before the Indy 500 because I do think they are the team to beat in the Indy 500. And just because I think you know they're overvalued in right. the Indy 500 market doesn't mean I don't think they still should be the favorites to win the Indy 500. They definitely should. But I think they're probably more like, as a team, 35%. Sure ballpark 33% to win the Indy 500 when I think the market has them at like plus 130 plus 140 to win. So, uh, you know, which is up over, uh, 40% to, to win in, in the market. So, um, I am I'm, I'm low on them for value in the race, but high on sure. them for value in the championship. I could be way off on this, but is Indy double points? Was that the Not case anymore. previously? Not or- anymore. It was okay. previously, but I, that got done away with a, a year or two ago. 
Okay, so no double points, but still potentially some value in buying to Penske as a different way to potentially get exposure to them for this race. So yeah. not betting Penske to win, maybe interesting Colton Herta, but Nick, what are your favorite outright bets for this year in the Indy 500? Yeah, Colton Herta. <laughs> Gotta go Colton Herta, 13, 15, whatever you can get him at in the teens. I like that. Uh, I already talked about him, so I'm going to move on to his teammate, which of course, is my favorite driver in the world. <laughs> so removing all bias aside, Kyle Kirkwood, I like him at 25 to 1 to win the Indy 500. And look, I've only bet Kyle Kirkwood once this year. So that tells you I'm very selective on when I do bet him. But uh, he is Colton's teammate. They have almost identical cars, almost identical setups. Last year, Kyle Kirkwood was probably going to win the race. Uh he, we talked about this Honda fuel saving stuff. They were getting great mileage. So on that second to last stint, he just started passing cars like crazy. And he came in after all the other cars on that final stint, short fill, started passing cars like crazy. And two cars ahead of him is Felix Rosenquist. Rosenquist, Rosenquist spins out. Kyle can't avoid it. Ends up on his lid uh, to end his Indy 500. But he probably had the best car, the best uh you know, I should say fuel load to, to carry him to the end there. He could have run harder than anybody else. So uh, I think we're going to see that again this year. I think Colton and Kyle both have great cars. All the hype is around Colton, but Kyle should be right there with him. Kyle out qualified Colton. Kyle probably should have. I mean, he definitely would have qualified even better if he hadn't made a mistake. We talk about the tools for Larson. Kyle Kirkwood made a mistake with his tools on his final qualifying lap. Probably should have qualified seventh, eighth, ninth instead is 11th because he forgot to adjust his weight jacker uh, on the final lap so that that he had to lift in the first turn of his final lap there, which killed his final qualifying lap. So this is the best starting position of his career in the Indy 500. And he probably was going to win it last year from, you know, the, I think it was the 13th starting position or, or, or so. And Joseph Newgarden won from the 17th starting position. And that's the thing you'll hear talk about how you have to start in the top 10 because, uh, of the last seven races, six have started inside the top 10. But the five races before that all came from outside the top 10. And all those are in the same car. If we take the 12 race sample of this car, the DW12 chassis, six winners inside the top 10, six winners outside the top 10. So I, I think Kyle Kirkwood definitely can come through the field. He's similar to Colton, looked amazing in practice, came from the back to the front uh, passing cars. Uh not quite, I would say, at will like Colton did, but still very comfortably. So Kyle Kirk with 25 to 1 is my other favorite outright bet if you're betting at this point in time. Yeah, we were officially in don't DM Nick mode last year when he was running so well. I was like, uh-oh, I feel good about this, and I don't want to be the guy who jinxes it. So I yeah. like, I was like, I'm going to let Nick be. I'm not going to message him about this. I don't want to jinx it. And it, <laughs> it didn't work out, obviously, and it was a scary crash. But like, you know, he yeah. was he was legitimately fast. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, th I thought it was a good call last year, too. So uh, Kirkwood, 25 to 1. Herta, 13 to 1. What about non-outrights? Any value for you there? Yeah, I, I think there's plenty. Um, I mean, if you want to take Kirkwood top 10, for example, I like, I'm just, you're going to keep hearing the same theme. Um, I There's one or two books out there that have matchups. I like Colton Herta over Alex Pillow. Uh, you know, if we get two guys that are in relatively equal equipment, both in Hondas, and one loves his car and one's making last minute changes, you got to go to the guy that loves his car, right? <laughs> so, uh, and who's, you know, they're starting right near each other. So there's no advantage in starting position or anything like that. So Colton Herta over Alex Pillow. And another one that I really like, is I've only seen this offered in one place, but total number of cautions over four and a half or over five and a half. Uh, I would definitely bet those in terms of four and a half. It happened in 10 of 12 years in this car and five and a half. Uh, it's gone over um, in one, two, three, four, five. So seven of 12. Uh, but this race also has the potential for rain, right? So we got the potential for rain, which will add an extra caution maybe or two if that happens. So I think there's extra value there. And there's a little quirk with IndyCar where when they throw a caution and then if that caution leads to a red flag for rain, then they restart the race. That counts as two cautions. Oh, cool. <laughs> so, yeah, that is even a little extra overvalue there. Um, so, yeah, that happened in 2007 when Dario Franchitti won that rain shortened race. There was an earlier red flag period and that counted as two yellows. So. Just a little sneaky value there. Uh, but, you know, if you want to go Colton top Honda, uh, like I said, that's fine. If you don't want to bet him to win the race, if you think Chevy's going to be too strong. Honda to win the race, I think there's value on them at like plus 170, plus 190. 
lot of lot of fun bets, but it's mostly just Chevy's overvalued, Honda's undervalued, Penske's overvalued, everybody else's is, is undervalued. Uh, you know, there, there's probably some long shot outright value as well on on some other guys, but my favorites are still Kyle and Colton. I love it. Again, Colton Hurd at 13 to 1, Kirkwood at 25 to 1, Nick's favorite bets for the Indy 500. You mentioned long shots, and I think that's interesting as we talk now about the Coca-Cola 600 for this weekend, because in the two races at at, Co- at Charlotte during the next-gen era, we've seen a lot of cautions. It's been uh, the second and third most cautions for any race in Charlotte history have come in the past two races, which are the two in the next-gen era. And if you look at what sports books are saying this week, they're saying to you, we expect regression. We don't think there will be as many cautions this time around. I tend to disagree, but I want a sanity check, Nick. Do you expect the chaos to continue at Charlotte this time around? Absolutely. I don't see why not. Uh, it, these are the same cars, the same, mostly the same drivers. We just saw chaos at Texas, which is another mile and a half. We saw chaos at Kansas, uh, especially in that third stage. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, I mean, these mile and a half races still get pretty chaotic. Uh, Las Vegas is the least chaotic of the mile and a half, ch- pretty much traditionally year after year. So I'm not really uh, too worried about the fact that it didn't have much chaos. But Kansas, Texas, Charlotte have all produced chaos in this next gen car. Uh, 16 and 18 cautions in the two years of the Coke 600. If we look at Texas, 16, 11, and 16 cautions in the next gen car. Uh, this is going to be a night race. And, and we saw when Kansas turned into night, it got a little crazy. So that extra downforce where you can run a little bit side by side easier, it, it it creates chaos. And it's 600 miles, right? This is the longest race of the year. Drivers get tired crazy at the end. Um, yeah, I expect I do expect chaos. And they get a little tired crazy if they ran 500 miles earlier on, which is important because Kyle Larson is the betting favorite to win the Coke 600 at FanDuel Sportsbook. He's sitting at plus 450. I am nowhere near that personally. Mm -hmm. Not sure where you are, but talking about outrights, Nick, which outrights do you think are values this week at FanDuel for the Coke 600? Um, None. (laughs) It's, (laughs) it's It's one of those weeks where I'm struggling to find outright value. Uh, I'm, I could go against my model. I do like, Martin Truex Jr. Uh, in terms of outright, you know, to win. He's a guy that excels at the Coca-Cola 600. He's done great here in the past. And I think he's a guy that the 600 miles doesn't bother him. He tends to perform better under the lights as well. We've noticed throughout his career, there's a statistically significant difference in how he runs in daytime races versus nighttime races uh, in terms of speed versus expectation. Uh, so I think Martin Truex Jr. 11 to one would be the one I would bet if I was trying to bet on this race to have some fun. I think Bubba Wallace 30 to one is interesting. Um, I technically don't have value again on him, but I would still, if I'm betting for fun, I'm betting Bubba Wallace at 30 to one. He's shown he can compete at these mile and a half tracks at the Coca-Cola 600. He's led before. Uh, so especially in 2022, he had a really good car. So I think Bubba Wallace 30, uh, Martin Truex Jr. 11 are probably the two outrights I would bet if I just wanted some action on this race. So I have only one driver where I am one percentage point above implied. That driver Mm -hmm. is Bubba Wallace. I have him at uh, 4.3% to win, 3.2% implied. That 2022 race you mentioned, do you remember what happened to him in that race? He got uh, caught up in a wreck. I think it was uh, maybe with Kyle Busch or somebody. I think it was... Blaney maybe but he he Blaney. like kind of spun just like half yeah. spun yeah and they pit it right before the stage break and they were like okay you know we'll save our tile tires we'll run like half yep. throttle and then flip the stage when everyone else pits and yep. they they failed the damage vehicle policy yeah <laughs> as a result he had to he had to retire from the race yeah yeah because that of that so silly. and so like they finished fifth in the <laughs> first stage and Booty Barker is like, yeah, I, I messed that up. That's my yep. bad. Um, no, they were really good in 2022. I remember that. And I remember he like had that spin. I, I didn't remember. Yep. There was another car that was involved. I couldn't remember which one. Yeah, I, I can't remember either. I think it might have been Blaney, but I'm not entirely sure. But then last year he had a pit penalty and went a lap down. Shocker. I know the team had mm-hmm. 16,000 pit penalties last year, <laughs> uh, but went a lap down, still finished fourth. So I think Bubba, as far as outrights go, the best bet. But I'm not seeing a lot of value there either beyond Bubba. I do like Bubba enough to bet him, but I think the biggest value is in the top 10 mark, which goes back to the chaos discussion. Yep. I expect chaos. Sounds like you do too. So any non-outrights you like this week? Yeah, like like you, the top 10s. And I think both you and I are on the same page. Obviously, we just, you know talked a little bit before uh, we recorded this, but tons of top 10 value. And uh, 
you know, I, I'm glad we're on the same page on that, but it is also a little scary to, to say right. we have about five or six drivers. We like it, right. you know, <laughs> four and a half, five to one or longer, some as long as like 16 to one. So it's definitely a bit scary, but if you size your bets, right, you can make money if even just one of them hits. So, yeah. uh, yeah, certainly possible to build a what I would almost consider a, a typical outright card for me, but with top 10 bets instead. Yeah, absolutely. Any any specific drivers who stand out to you as far as top 10s go who you'd want to zero in on here? Yeah, my favorite that jumped right off the the you know board to me was Chase Briscoe, plus 450. Uh, I messaged you I last night. I messaged you. I said, do you have monster value on Briscoe? Because I sure do. And you did. And so that's my favorite one, Chase Briscoe, plus 450. If we look at the five races, uh, what I would call like the chaos races of Charlotte and Texas, Briscoe's finished top 10 in four of them. And the only one he didn't was Charlotte last year. But remember, that team was running in the 30s all the first half of the year at intermediate tracks. They just had something wrong and they couldn't figure out what it was. They got it corrected the second half of the year, ran much better. So we almost can consider that one an aberration. And then he's four for four uh, at these races at finishing inside the top 10. My model has him around um, 25%. I think you're even a little higher on that than me. But Chase Briscoe jumped right off the map to me, plus 450 for a top 10. Yeah, I have him at 28%, so a hair above you. But like I was thinking back to that 2022 race, the year where he was not yep. in dog do form yeah he was trying to pass larson with two laps left for the win mm -hmm. and he wrecked he still finished fourth like which is absurd but yeah. like because there was another caution after that but like he almost won this race and he's 80 to one to win which i don't have a ton of value there i took him at 100 personally yeah. uh but i have him i took him 10 to one top five and i've got him valuing him top 10 too at plus 450 so i feel like we kind of forgotten how good he can be at this track type when Stuart haas's equipment is less atrocious than it was last year and and their equipment is less atrocious than it was if we look at right. uh for example um texas earlier this year uh briscoe was seventh in uh, green flag speed sixth in average running position and three of the the Stuart haas cars were in the top 15 in average running position so if you're running 15th it, you know even in the top 15 i should say an average running position plus 450 is just too long for a top 10 and Stuart haas racing had three of the cars at texas in that range yeah, I just think that they're a lot better now and it's not been accounted for yet because small sample on this track type, but the sample we've gotten has been very, very good. I think yeah. I trust that sample personally. So Chase Briscoe plus 450 for a top 10 considerations for Martin Truex Jr. 11 to 1 and Bubba Wallace at 30, but primarily primarily focusing on the Briscoe top 10 for Nick. That is Dr. Nick Giffen. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at Rotodoc. Check out the Stacking Denny's and Running Hot podcasts as well. Check out Nick's work over at the Action network nick i appreciate the time as always good luck to you this weekend enjoy indy 500 rooting for kyle for you as well we'll talk to you again soon sounds good jim thanks and uh enjoy it yourself and hopefully for your sake we get uh you know no rain there for for indy exactly i'm, I'm fingers crossed for that for sure all right again find nick on twitter at rotodoc before we close up for today though did want to go through the monaco grand prix and outline where i see value at FanDuel for this one and monaco is a pretty tough track to project because it's so dependent on what happens on saturday during qualifying so as we go check out the odds over at FanDuel Sportsbook for this race, you're going to see a very different distribution than what we typically see for a Formula One race, where Max Verstappen is minus 140. He'd typically be, even considering McLaren's gains, probably minus 250, minus 300, somewhere in there. It's reflective of how tough it is to pass in Monaco. So if Max does not win the pole, his odds of winning the race go down pretty dramatically. So it's a very tough race to model. But to me, it's very clear that McLaren is legit. As a result of that, I think that the best value for this week at FanDuel Sportsbook is on Lando Norris to win the race. That is plus 550 at FanDuel Sportsbook. Norris had the big upgrade in Miami and he won there and then goes out to Imola this past week and, you know, steadily running in second place, good tire conservation, and he actually catches Verstappen in the final couple laps. Tough track to pass. It didn't get that pass done, but if Lando wins that race, He's not plus 550 to win here in Monaco for this weekend. I've got Norris at 16.8% to win this week versus 15.4% implied, and I'm very willing to bet that. You got to make sure, though, that Lando can win the poll because qualifying is so predictive of finishing order in Monaco. And 
Digging to the data, I think he can do so. You remember back in Miami, it was the first race of the upgrades for Lando Norris. And in that race, they had sprint qualifying. And Norris had the fastest lap of any driver in the sprint race qualifying. It happened during the second round of qualifying rather than the third. So he didn't get the pole for the sprint race, but had issues during Q3 there. And so he didn't start in the pole. But I think that led to a masking of how good his pace was in Miami and some value for him entering Sunday for that race. And I think that's still being masked here. Last week in Imola, both Norris and his teammates, Oscar Piastri, finished within a tenth of Verstappen during qualifying. So I do think that Norris can win the pole here, despite the fact he has this one pole in his entire career in Formula One. So plus 550 at FanDuel Sportsbook of value for me, and I do think he can win the pole. So I feel good about that bet. Despite the fact Monaco is a very tough race to project, I think we can go towards Lando Norris plus 550 to win this race at FanDuel Sportsbook. If you remember last year's show, there was a modeling error, I think, at sportsbooks for uh, Monica specifically, where they weren't baking in enough correlation between the driver who wins the poll and the driver to win the race. That has been corrected because a FanDuel sportsbook, Lando Norris, plus 650 to win the poll in the race. That implies that if he were to win the poll, his odds to win the race would be 87%. So that's about right. They've got that figured out. That's not universally true, I will say. There are some sports books that have not figured out that correlation just yet. Uh, so you can get Norris as long as plus 850. But if FanDuel specifically, they unfortunately did figure it out. So I don't see value there personally on Norris to win the poll and win the race. Instead, I want to go towards the outright. Lando Norris has pushed for wins in two consecutive weeks. He showed he can get the job done in Miami. I think he can get the job done once again this week in Monaco. So my favorite bet for the Monaco Grand Prix is Lando Norris to win plus 550 over at FanDuel Sportsbook for this week. That's all we got here for today on Covering the Spread. Big thank you once again to Dr. Nick Giffen for joining us. Check out Nick on Twitter at Rotodoc. Be sure to check out his podcast, Running Hot and Stacking Denny's as well. Find all of his work over on the Action Network to get yourself prepped for the Indy 500 and the Coca-Cola 600. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonis. You can also find FanDuel Research on Twitter at FanDuel Research. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets across Wednesday. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow, breaking down some NBA and NHL with Tom Vecchio. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 